Ben Nash here. I'm a co-founder at XY Advisor and founder of financial advice business Pivot Wealth. My business baby I started from scratch a bit over six years ago. In that time, I've leveraged some of the learnings of the XY community to scale the business and become one of the better known financial advice businesses for high income accumulators. You can join me each Tuesday as I have the privilege of interviewing some amazing people where I'll selfishly be able to uh, continue my personal journey to improve every aspect of my advice process and hopefully you can learn a few things on the journey as well. Jump over to xyadvisor.com if you haven't signed up already to share and learn from other advisors or simply download the app. Accelerating innovation and globalization trends are disrupting global markets. We are a new generation asset management team that looks beyond traditional public markets to understand how innovation and disruption can benefit everyone. We are uniquely structured to solve the underweight to accelerating global innovation as we transition from Web 2.0 into Web 3.0. Our competitive advantage lies in the integration of our deep asset management and technology expertise under one aligned group to capitalize on the exponential opportunities of Web 3.0. The opportunities are for everyone. Invest different with Holon. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor team and today I'm really pumped to be here with uh, James Wrigley. James is a, the principal advisor at First Financial or one of the principal advisors at First Financial. Uh, he works with high income families and retirees, uh, helping them be smarter with their money. He recently has taken over TikTok, so we're going to dive a little bit uh, into that as well as talk about um, some of the things that James focuses on now. James, thanks for joining us, buddy. Hey Ben, thank you for having me here. It's uh, it's exciting to speak to you. <laughs> Watched you on LinkedIn for for quite some time. Uh, it's good to uh, to finally meet you actually and and have a chat. So thanks for having yes. me here. Oh mate, good good to be with you. I've been stalking you from the shadows as well. So um, you know, here we are. LinkedIn, LinkedIn yeah. gives it away. You can't be, you can't stalk too much. They give it away. That's right. Yeah, but uh, no, it's funny that stuff that you. Um, you follow people and their stuff from afar for a little bit and it's like you do build that virtual relationship and it's like mm -hmm. you, I know that we all see it and I know that you see the end of it like we do with clients and then they come in and they're saying all of these things and they understand that stuff and they're like, oh, yeah. you said that and it's, you know, a bit weird but I suppose it's um, it's just the way of the future, especially now that we're all uh, bunking down in our COVID shelters. So, uh, you know. <laughs> But James, look, I'm uh, I'm keen to dive into some of the business growth, some teams and team growth, because I think in the mm. current environment that we're seeing that um, you know as you start building a bit of traction, that the you realise that your team becomes an all important part of what you do, and particularly for a lot of businesses at the moment um, that are doing well, that they're, that they're doing quite well and, and particularly busy. I think that partly the COVID situation has got a lot of people thinking about their money. Obviously, we're, um, you're probably across them uh, as well, if not better than I am, but some of those saving stats for households that people have got a few extra pennies in the bank, yeah. which is, you know, when it's earning half percent in a bank account, that they're realising that there's an opportunity there or an issue that they should be addressing so um, it's it's keeping us all on our toes, and you realise that your team and um, the, the the people that you have around you become all important. So I know that in your business that you, you know you work in a business that's been around for a long time. You've been around for a long time in that business, and you 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 were just saying to me off air that you work in sort of a pod type system where you've got your you know you've got advisors, associates, support that sit underneath you that you directly look after, and then there's other pods doing similar things. So Keen to pick your brain, like what have you found? Um, what are some of the lessons that you've learned around building a great team of people around you? Uh, lessons that I've learned, I, I think you, you need to spend the time with each individual person first and foremost to kind of understand them and where they're at and what they want to do. You know, it, we work in financial advice and by default, you might assume that everyone has aspirations of being a financial advisor, but they don't and that's perfectly fine so we spend a lot of time I spend a lot of time with my team um, just working through what what they each individually want and that's nothing new hopefully most people are doing that with their teams but 
how can I kind of help you be the best version of you in whatever job it is that you want to do? So whether it's if you want to mm. be an associate advisor for for you know for your career, fantastic. How can we support you and continue to grow? Because I think once people stop growing, that's when they start to get bored and and look elsewhere. So mm. how can you how can we support you to continue to be the best at what you want to be and continue to challenge you so that you want to I keep showing up for work each day, particularly at the moment when we're not all getting together in the office. So, you know, I'm I'm in Melbourne. We are slowly getting back into the office, but like I was in the office three days last week and I think Wednesday was the, the busiest day. There was five of us in the office, whereas before COVID there would have been 50 of us in the office in the first financial as a business of about 50 people. So it is challenging, but it, kind of making that time to, to just check in with each individual person and what do they want to do and how can we continue to support them. I, I, that's the best I've been able to come up with in the last couple of years. It's it's worked yeah. okay. My team's going along all right. And I've had some people come and go. Actually, I had a I'll maybe talk about that that later on. My team had a big changeover in the last in the last you know, twelve months prior, but yeah, since we're going okay now. Yeah, look, I think that the COVID situation has got a lot of people, one, that it's it changes the work dynamics and how we're working, you know, who we're working with, businesses, I think in particular, my, my own included, like especially at the start of lockdown, so much uncertainty out there, the world sort of seized up a little bit and that really, um, you know, freaked me out. I think it freaked a lot of people out and uh, a lot of businesses were making sure that we, we were, you know, doing all the things that we could to to set up for the future it also is a situation especially when you're forced into remote working without a considered sort of calculated approach to get there that it can and did i know for us like highlight some cracks in and gaps in in terms of how we were doing what we were doing but it's interesting what you say because i think sometimes it's the simplest things are the best things and the most effective things i know that we see that when we're talking with our clients it's like what's the what's one of the most things that the most powerful things you can do with your money well it's spend less than you earn and then just invest you know regularly yeah. and consistently <laughs> like it, it's uh, sometimes not earth shattering but there are things that it's easy to get caught up in all the hype and you know all the shiny objects that you can mm. do it and then you can lose sight of the basics and that's when those cracks turn into um crevices and you know it's it creates further challenges from there exactly um, What's it? Well, I'm I'm keen to pick your brain, and you mentioned that this might tie in with what you mentioned around some of the changes in, mm. in your team. But from a recruiting and and hiring and onboarding perspective, I know it's something I feel like we've been hiring for um, a couple of years for advisors mm. in particular. You know, like we're trying. I've been trying to recruit for two good senior advisors for um, a few months, and it's. I've learned a ton, ton, ton about hiring from picking people's brains and reading and learning and just also just having the experience around that, that um, especially for advisor hiring, I find that sometimes you've got fantastic advisors that are not necessarily going to be fantastic advisors in your business because there's a lot of different ways to um, to to do advice. And, you know, I know that I've had a few of those conversations and now we're focusing on trying to make sure that they can not only do the work or the clients, but fit in with the team, have the skill set to be happy in the role and in flow as well. So selfishly, I'm keen to pick your brain. What, <laughs> uh, what tips do you have there when it comes to effective hiring and advisor hiring? Yeah, I, I see your, um, your your name on LinkedIn. It, like, I, it, it seemed to me from the outside is that you were hiring every single advisor in the country. You're building this army <laughs> or, or, you're, or you're really trying to find the, the, the right person. So in our business, we very rarely hire a financial advisor. Very, very rarely. I'd be able to count on one hand the number of times we've hired an advisor in the nearly fifteen years that I've worked in the worked in the business. So we so what you're we saying is I'm screwed. Is that what you're saying? Well, we, we kind of have the luxury. <laughs> First financial and different names is a bit older than 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 your business. Uh, uh. We have the luxury of a big team, and so yeah. that that. That does two things. We would typically hire two, maybe three grad type university grads each year into our client services team. Mm. Some of them will stay, some of them won't. 
uh, but we would hire, we tend to hire internally. And so we're more often hiring in at that kind of client service manager type level uh, mm-hmm. into the, into our client services team. And then we grow them through, through the business. Uh, we were talking off air about the first financial way meetings that we have about, you know, this is the particular way that we would like to explain certain topics to clients so that they're getting that similar kind of message. And so they're, they're, they're growing in their learning and their, and their, and their understanding as well as their careers through, through first financial. So most people tend to come in there and then they progress on to be associate advisors and they'll do their few years as associate advisors. Now they're having to do their professional year studies as well. Uh, and then ultimately become an advisor. I've actually had, and kind of you're doing this already anyway, it doesn't, doesn't help. Uh, I've actually had a lot of success in the last 12, 18 months or so, we've hired some really amazing people that have come about just through my LinkedIn network. And so like I started putting content out on LinkedIn to try and attract clients and say, look, I'm talking about these types of things and it's going to attract a certain type of client. And eventually they start to reach out. I put out an, an ad. So one of the, one of the advisors in my team was going on maternity leave. Her associate advisor had just resigned and we were looking for a replacement that was going to be a bit of a hybrid to be a to be an advisor to some of the uh, some of Steph's clients when she went on maternity leave, as well as being an associate advisor for for some of these other clients. Uh, and the guy that joined joined that joined us had just saw my post on LinkedIn, had watched a lot of my stuff before, and then it was only because of my post on LinkedIn went to the job ad on Seek and put in an application. And and since then we've had another few other people have joined in different areas I've got, and we've had a really great new hire in our an, an associate advisor in our business someone else in the client services team that have just come through that network but they've been seeing the stuff that I'm talking about and the stuff that we're doing you go oh that's really interesting and they they kind of gel with it mm. and have applied for jobs and have been absolutely amazing people in the in in the team um, so it's happened that way we're finding recruiting through recruiters. Uh, it's not the recruiter's fault, but but the the market's really tough out there for client service managers, for for associates, for advisors. The good ones are being snapped up within a couple of days. It's so tough mm-hmm. at the moment, and um, salaries are continually going up. Yeah, yeah, it's a challenge. Yeah, it's an interesting space and we're, we've got a great recruiting partner as well. But like you say, it's sort of the market is the market is the market. Mm-hmm. And, um, for us, we're, we're now in the process of growing our own advisors. It's just that we have a need. So I think that these advisors that we hire are probably the last advisors that we'll hire. Um, but it's like you, like you say that the advantage of an established business has been going for a long time that that's been growing for a long time is that you bring people in and then they can develop, you can grow them into that role. And I'm pumped that I think that the, you know, the associates that we've got now will grow into advisors and pick things up probably more quickly than even someone with 10 or 20 years experience, um, because they already know our way of doing things and all the different aspects of the of the role so they definitely will from yeah from our experience you'll have you'll you will have a much better experience with those that are growing within the business Mm. it's just hard to get there now the 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 problem that we you know can come across at some points in time is if we've got these clients coming in and we desperately need another advisor but the next person that's kind of you know on that career trajectory is you know maybe 12 months or so away particularly yeah. in a professional year it makes it really tough if you're relying on promoting within mm. it makes it makes it really tough to fill that gap yeah yeah you definitely need to make sure that you've got plenty rising up to to fill things at the at mm. the right time so mm. um yeah, well, watch the hold the phone on that one, James. I'll I'll be sure to <laughs> fill you in when we crack the code. Um, but mate, I'm keen to. You've been in your business for um, some time, like a decade and a half, pretty much. Not that you've mm-hmm. been old enough to um, yeah. uh, have been have been doing anything for, for that amount of time. But mate, I'm keen to understand. And you 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 were telling me that your business has gone through a number of evolutions. Clearly, it was a fairly you know uh, established business. It's been around for a long time. Yep. I, um, the the question that I sometimes ask in these conversations is like, wh- how have you built out the service solution? But what I'm keen to hear from your side of things is like, what's changed in that time? What what have been the key, yeah, the key progression of 
what you're actually delivering, what problems you're solving and how you're going about it hmm. in the time that you've been in your business? Look, I, I, think, I think for the most part, the, the broader first financial business is still working with the same demographic of client that we always have. So we have a, a long history and then in the part of the business that I, that I work in, a, a long history of bank execs retiring, lots of money in super, hundreds of thousands of dollars in bank shares and saying, James, what do I do now? I'm used to collecting my salary. What do I do? How do I, how do I reshuffle things? So we're still now like there's just this, you know, th- there's always new 60-year-olds or 65-year-olds that are faced with those same type of problems. And, and so sure the way that we deliver advice is a little bit different now than, than, than what it was, but it's still solving that same type of problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, in in addition to that, there's me and and a couple of others that are of a similar age to me, and you know you'll see this yourself. You tend to kind of attract clients that look and smell a little bit like what you do, and are going through similar kind of things that you do. Mm. So I now find myself working with a whole lot of higher income families. They're you know late thirties, early forties couple of kids, they're often at school, they've got their house, they've settled into it, they've got some money in their offset and they're saying, what's next? You know, we've we've bought the house, kids are settled, we've done all those those things that someone's told us we should do, all of these kind of life events and it's how do we make the most of the financial position that we find ourselves in now so that when we are 60 or we are 65 or we are 70, you know, we can have that, that, that ideal retirement whilst enjoying life now it's this this kind of balance of spending time and money on doing things now versus versus later on we never used Uh to do much in that space so so doing a lot more there now um Uh you know with mortgages and you know borrowing money and offset accounts and you know you were talking off air about your employee share scheme um videos and things that 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 you're running um like a, a lot of that type of stuff whereas 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we did not we did none of it. If you if you weren't 60 years old and knocking on the door of retirement, we yeah. couldn't help you go go somewhere else. Uh, whereas now there's a few, you know, mid to late 30 something year old, early 40 something year old advisors that are juggling those problems themselves and they find themselves working with clients that are juggling those same problems too. Mm-hmm. Um, which is exciting. I I enjoy I'd be bored out of my brains if I was just dealing with 65 year old retirees I don't know if it would be bored out of my brains if I was just dealing with 40 year olds but I like having the 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 mix yeah absolutely I think that it's for us we're working with a lot of clients in that similar demographic as well and it's generally pretty interesting work and like you say that you really relate to the the issues and challenges that they're facing and I think that well, I think everyone can relate to wanting to save tax and you know um, boost their passive income. That when you're helping people work through those decisions around schooling and family and where do they live and getting that uh, dream home and being mortgage free, that it is just a little closer to home. So it, it sort of helps to relate personal experiences. James, what what's different? Do you, or do you do things differently or is it the same approach? I know that you've got your the first financial way that you were saying and, you know, communicating yeah. things in the same ways, but in cre- essentially creating a service solution that's going to be relevant and valuable for people that are at those earlier stages of their life. If, was there any significant differences in um, how you did what you did? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so we're, we're dealing with different things. Like it used to all be about superannuation and pensions and retirement. And a lot, a lot, a lot of SMSF work, a lot of strategy work around SMSFs. Still a lot, still a lot of that. But yeah, there's a there's a lot more about about you know spending less than what you earn. We we're talking about before spending less than what you earn and doing something productive with the difference. It's not with the difference. It's not not huge, but then individual circumstances will 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 dictate different things depending on what people are going through and what it is that they're what they're trying to achieve. So I had to build out a way of a way of doing that, some some tools for interacting with clients to try and make it a little bit more visual uh, and understand what we're what we're doing. And, and uh, a lot of and we we never used to do much of this in years gone by. 
some type of like modeling earlier on in the piece. And then, you know, some people will say, you're crazy. You, you never did any of that before, but we never did any of that before because we were dealing with people that would come in and say, James, I've got one and a half million dollars in my super fund. Help me sort it out. Yeah. It was, there was no more future planning to be done. It was, they were, they'd retired yesterday. Yeah. Um, so, so now there's, you know, these, these kind of more interactive tools that we're using with, with clients, which is really just a glorified Excel spreadsheet is for the most part of what we, what we're using. But, pulling a whole range of inputs to say, okay, well, if you just keep going along in the direction that you're going, this is likely where you're going to end up. But, hey, if we change this thing and we do that thing and we get a little bit more creative and with, with what you're doing, what what type of difference can we make both now and for you in 10, 15, 20 years' time? Um, we had to build out that part of the engagement and so we spent a fair bit of time on that and then you know, training internally this this first financial way meetings that we run monthly mm. uh, to get everyone doing you know talking about the same things in the same way uh, yeah we had to we spent a lot of time working on on that and to different levels of success some people are doing it better than others when you've got you know, 16 or 17 advisors in the business that's always going to be the case not everyone's going to be doing the same things at the same time mm. but at least everyone's got the tools to to be able to to do the work if they if they choose to be engaging with those types of clients. Yeah, I've found that for the younger ones in particular, that scenario stuff is is really key and, and what they want. And it actually blows me away that people still make such big decisions without having that in place. Like you, yeah. people talk about like, uh, you know, you're buying a million dollar property or a $2 million property and they're doing it from sort of like, oh, I think that works or my hmm. mortgage broker said that I can, this is the, payments at this level and i think that sort of fits that it's just like holy crap like these decisions are so big um yeah. and impact you for like a decade or you know a couple of decades potentially that um yeah it's sort of when you see the power and what people change when they do have that clarity then uh yeah i just wonder like how it's it just seems crazy that people do it without it so yeah you get the, like you just constantly bring it back to this idea of why you know you'll, you'll come across people who've got their house and bought an investment property why like what is it that you're trying to achieve by buying this investment mm. property on oh, negative mm. gearing okay well let me tell you what it actually what negative gearing actually means and and unless you're getting yeah. growth on the other side then not, then you may as well just be donating money to a charity um, <laughs> yeah, yeah so bringing it back to this why thing and and having these tools to interact with the clients earlier on in the piece is is really powerful and you know people listening will be saying you're mad we've been doing that for years yes <laughs> we, we hadn't been and uh and now we do <laughs> <laughs> oh nice yeah no it's definitely the way of the future um but james i'm keen to shift gears a bit and talk about sort of marketing and, and business mm. growth i know that you um you've been at it for a while i'm keen to hear like from your side what are the channels that um have worked for you and, and what have been the key drivers of the growth of your your client group over time yeah so so by and large most of it's referrals from existing clients so that's where most of our new client work has come from historically yeah. uh, a few years back i started I, I had this kind of thought go off in my head that I, I had a really good year, one year from from a new client point of view. Uh, I had lots of referrals from a particular accountant, which was fantastic. But I had this kind of thought went off in my head to say, what if for some reason this accountant doesn't like me anymore? He likes the other guy better and all of a sudden he starts referring all of this work somewhere else. And so I didn't want to be reliant on, on new client work coming to me from like one particular source. I wanted clients to come and work with me because they wanted to work with me, not because someone told them that they should come and work. Mm. And then, you know, seen all this stuff, you know, Gary V and his, you know, videos and stuff. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to try this, try this, this social media type stuff and, <laughs> and, and, and started posting things. And so it's been going for years now that I've been doing it. Um, uh, it started with LinkedIn initially, <laughs> mainly because, uh, no friends or family saw my LinkedIn stuff. So I could, you know, I wasn't likely to go to mum and dad's place on the weekend and I say, oh, I saw your video yeah. and, and, and like laugh at me. So I was trying to avoid that. <laughs> so I tried, like, I, so I did the, like, you know, 
written posts on there, shorter form videos, the live ones. Like I know you do a lot of live ones right. and that the, the live it's, I found the live video itself on LinkedIn, like that itself was almost a waste of time, but the using the audio for a podcast, putting the video on YouTube, chopping up a particular segment and making it short. Like if you're repurposing that, then it became worthwhile. Uh -huh. um, I've had, you know, I, I had a meeting with someone last last week that said, oh, I reached out to you because I'd seen your videos on YouTube. Like I got a whole 140 people that subscribe to my YouTube channel. There's hardly anyone there, but uh -huh. the videos that are there were all, all either interviews or longer live streams that are done on LinkedIn and, and and put them there. So, so that was worthwhile. And then more like more recently, LinkedIn's been driving a lot of new client work for me. Uh, in the most recent fortnight, two to three weeks, uh, it, it's it's been TikTok, which is just completely unbelievable to me. I put up a video a few weeks ago about how do you how do you go from having you know, that house that you live in with a mortgage to that upgrader house and you want to keep the first one, how should you go about doing that with your mortgage and your offset accounts and those kind of things? Mm. Uh, and that, that, that video blew up. I went from about 120 followers on my TikTok account to I think I'm about 7,500 now in the last three or four weeks. And wow. the number of new clients that have, number of people that have been booking in phone calls to have with me to ask some questions and some of them are progressing to, to advice is just unbelievable I, I can't even comprehend it's um it's huge yeah that's amazing and so because mm. you've only been at it for how long on the tiktok uh i'd had the tiktok account since some point last year but i wasn't really using it i just yeah. joined tiktok because i saw this thing and i put a few couple of videos and you know you might get 100 views or something they just didn't go anywhere but i had I had one video that's I think it's up to something like seventy thousand views by now, and that mm. kick started a whole lot of people connecting with me and then you get a lot of people asking questions and TikTok has this amazing feature where you can reply to the question with a video so someone will ask some question and I just point the camera at my face and spend thirty seconds to a minute and a half responding to their question and that then drives more questions and so now I'm finding that I'm probably doing like I might do one original video a day and maybe three or four responses to questions um, each day. And I've been doing that for the last three or four weeks. And, yeah, we're getting lots and lots and lots of people inquiring, like booking out, to, reaching out directly from TikTok to book in meetings. Our um, new client, sorry, our contact us web form that we have on our website is just like we've had, four times as many people you know go through there than what we what we normally would it's um it's amazing yeah, wow that's great and yeah, what amazing. when you when you started going heavier into this did how did you go about sort of planning out what you were going to cover and and what you talk about was it considered strategy or you <laughs> no not, not considered at all but you get but mine i'm just found in the last few weeks mine's gotten to a point where people are asking certain questions and i'm like well if this person's asking that question. There's probably someone else out there that's asked that wants to know the same answer. So yes. some of them I'll just respond back to, like answering the question. I did. I literally did one this morning, walking from my house to the gym down the road at six thirty this morning, answering someone's question. And I think that's got like fifteen hundred views on it already in today. Um, it started out with I was re I was recording some more videos for LinkedIn. I was just set up here at the desk where I am, and I had the camera set up, and I was going to do some more more videos. And I thought, you know what, I've I've got I've had these ideas. I've just recorded something. I'm going to spin the camera around to make it vertical, and I'll just record the same thing, but just a bit more concise to post on TikTok. And I did that. I had three videos that I put almost word for word the same thing. Some were landscape I put on LinkedIn. Some I made it vertical and put it on TikTok. Mm. And, uh, and one of them happened to get some traction and it's built up um, the following from there. So as far as TikTok goes, my page is tiny, but uh, <laughs> it's it's more than our financial planning business can cope with. That's great. And you wouldn't think like I've, you know, I'm not a really a TikToker, um, although I see that the, the massive popularity of, the, of that sort of platform. But 
I wouldn't have thought, and you uh, and I have had a bit of a look around and like you know look at an article and see the the fin talkers and people that um, look at stuff, and a lot of them are talking about some you know how to make quick money in a short <laughs> amount of time or how to be incredibly frugal. And I think that one of them I think is a bit of bullshit. The second one is is probably has some merit, but um, is you know not sort of the typical client subset that you would consider engaging a professional mm. financial planner. So, mm. what sort of pe- what sort of um, people are you talking to? Is it a um, range? Or, yeah. So it it's the so so I'm putting out stuff that I'm talking about with my clients, and so it, it's it's that demographic that that's coming back. So like high income families, you know, four hundred thousand dollar plus income families, they've got a Two and a half million dollar house, eight hundred grand in their offset account. Uh, they got their employee share scheme, these kind of things. So, like a few of them, I've for all of the clients that I do advice for, I, I I do a strategy diagram that starts with me, like literally with a pencil drawing on a page and circles and lines and stuff going over the all over the place. Yeah, I've then just turned the camera around and say, "Hey, I'm working on some advice for this client. They look like A, B, C, and D. Let me show you what we're doing." And I just spin the camera around and show the page to say, you know, we're going here to there and there's lines and stuff. I have to, mm. I've had to be careful to not put like the names of super funds that <laughs> yeah. we might be using and take that yeah. product stuff off because early on I had a few clients going, oh, which, what do you mean net wealth? Which net wealth? Is it this net wealth or that net wealth? I'm like, uh, oh, hang on. Yeah. no, we need to be careful there. Um, and so then, then that's then attracting a person that looks like that. Like I would have had a dozen phone calls with people a lot of them from New South Wales, um, you know, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollar plus incomes, that, and then and then there's a whole other older age bracket that are uh, late mid to late fifties, and I think that's more just timing more than anything. They've all got every phone call I have with them said, "Oh yeah, our kids are twenty one or twenty two. I reckon what they've done is they've spent time with their kids over Christmas. They've yeah. seen their twenty one year old daughter doing these videos, and they're going, "What the hell is this?" Yeah. joining TikTok, mum and dad are mid to late 50s and are now saying, oh, well, you know, we're looking at retiring in the next five to 10 years and up comes James talking about superannuation and pensions and investing for retirement and then they've booked in some some phone calls. So I was amazed as any to yeah. the people that are on there but, you know, it's working for the moment. It might stop tomorrow morning. It might be getting excited <laughs> about nothing. It could all stop tomorrow but... That is what it you is never know that that uh, that algorithm it could it could get you, but um, I don't know. I, I um, it sounds like it's it's delivering some great results, and it's interesting to hear, especially with the older demographic. I wouldn't have picked that those you, you would think people in their fifties yeah. and sixties yeah. cruising TikTok looking for uh, how to retire yeah. or their super like the, so. questions about when can I access my super and the age pension and. What if I take out all my money from super to buy a house? Can I then claim the age pension after? Like all of the, like lots of these types of questions yeah. popping up all the time from you know, 60 year olds. It's, um, it's amazing. Yeah. Interesting. And look, I think that, you know, it's it, one of the things that I struggle with a bit is, and we do a lot of content marketing, but it's hard to be present everywhere all of the time. And I love a good process. So I try to put a process around our marketing, but um, you know, how have you tackled over the last little bit? You said you've gone through a bit of a progression between different platforms and channels. Like um, how do you actually tackle it so that you're, you're doing the, you know, the things that are delivering results, but without trying to be everywhere all at once and ending up being nowhere at any time. So the the repurposing of content is is really important. So putting this putting like I'll do a video and put it on LinkedIn and then I'll put it on my Instagram page and you know, some of the, the, the longer stuff. It might have been a live stream that'll sit on my LinkedIn profile and anyone can go back and view the live stream, but then using that audio on a podcast. So just just trying to put this content in in the places where people might want to consume it and everyone's going to be different for that. So just trying to put it in, in these different places. But then if I'm if I'm putting the same thing in different places, then I'm not having to reinvent the wheel each time. I'm not having to come up with a new idea to talk about in half a dozen different places. Right. Uh, and then it's just time. So I, so I do it all myself. Like we have, like First Financial has a has a marketing group, I guess, that, that, that we work with that help you know, write articles for our newsletter and 
keep our website up to date and and coordinate all of all of that type of stuff but but the james wrigley social media things that's all me and it used to be when i was commuting backwards and forwards from from the city on the train i used to spend my time on the train doing it so i'd record a couple of videos on the weekend and then i'd sit on the train and i'd just edit them i did everything on my phone i'd edit it on my phone and Mm. Turn it, you know, put captions and stuff on, do it on my phone. So I was using that time backwards and forwards for it. Now that I'm not going into the city quite so often at the moment, it's a bit tougher. All happening on that walk to the gym, mate. Yeah, the walk to the gym. And and I guess that's where TikTok makes life a little bit easier. It's nowhere near as polished and no one's expecting it to be anywhere near as polished. Yeah. I can I can have just rolled out of bed and my voice is croaky walking to the gym and and that's perfectly fine. No one cares. Mm. I'm sure no one would care on LinkedIn either, but um, I don't know. I just have a perception yeah. that people would. Well, that's the thing. And I think that with the content marketing and I see the stuff that we do, it's just that constant virtual tap on the shoulder. And, you know, maybe people pay attention, maybe they don't, but you're just, just there. And it's sometimes it's just they might not even listen to a video, but they, they'll see the headline or they see the grab or the hashtag or something like that. But sometimes mm-hmm. it's just that's enough. Um and yeah i think it's easy to i know that when i first started doing content i was trying to um yeah script videos and like nail them out and chopping together sentence after sentence and green screens and all this stuff and really like you just go okay well there's a phone or there's a webcam like fire that bad boy up and off you go and you know it's going to connect with people at if you get hit the right person at the right time with the right message and it probably doesn't matter too much what's happening behind you or whether there's some guy drilling in the roof above you, although maybe that matters a little bit, but um, yeah, it's it's um, it's sometimes like I say that that's enough. It is, yeah, it is, it, it, and it's just you know, the. I've had a few conversations with people that have reached out from LinkedIn that said said you know I've seen your stuff for like four years or you know we connected so long ago and I've no interaction with them whatsoever, but it's like if if. James's face keeps popping up. He must be doing something all right. Otherwise, he would have gone out of business. And uh, yeah. and if he keeps showing up, well, then you know, it's this whole kind of no like and trust thing. If he keeps showing up, you just subconsciously they build a level of trust, and eventually, when the time's right, we'll reach out. That's right. Yeah, I think that there, when it comes to content marketing in particular, there's so many fly by nighters that people come and they talk talk a big game and they're saying they're spouting off this stuff, but then you know, they go away or things change and they just don't focus on it. Whereas when you're just consistent and, and there that people see it and go, oh, that person, they, they, don't, they don't look crazy or they don't look too crazy. Yeah. And then it's just like six months later, a year later, two years later, three years later, four years later, like you're still there and they're going, okay, well, no one's throwing stuff at this person. Like you say, they haven't gone out of business, so they must be doing something okay. Maybe yeah. it's worth, worth the conversation. Yeah. Uh, but, mate, I very much look forward to our next conversation where you can uh, tell me about the TikTok domination um, and how that's progressed. But really appreciate you sharing your, your insights. It's great to see it coming together. My last question for you is that if you could go back to um, – to your, you know, little James, the advisor first starting off fresh faced in uh, what you were doing, what would be your one piece of advice that uh, that you would give yourself? Uh, I'd say just just take your time. Like it just, it will happen and you'll eventually get there and feel like it's only just the beginning. Like I've been doing this for a while now and, and things that are, you know, things that are happening this year versus last year versus the year before it, it, you know, every year kind of just feels like the beginning things that just keep getting better um yeah so just take your time there's plenty of time ahead of you it doesn't have to happen tomorrow and yeah you'll you'll get there and you'll go past where you thought you might have got been able to get to I love that. Just like our clients that I think that it's con- that we have this constant frustration that you're, especially as someone that you sort of bit master of your own destiny, that you're always looking at the next thing and the next thing. And sometimes you can get frustrated with things not coming together the way that you want. But um, often when you look back at what's happened, then um, 
yeah, you, you see that, that all of the progress that has been made and uh, give you the motivation to keep on that path. So, mm-hmm. mate, very, very wise words, James. Well, thank you, sir. Really appreciate you sharing your insights. And uh, like I say, look forward to that TikTok domination in the next one, bud. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for having me on. <laughs>